summer reading club or if you would like to be go ahead and put your name and library card number down you'll get credit for summer reading so you'll get entries into our prize drawings if you're not part of our summer reading club yet but would like to join um, go ahead and fill it out as it comes by and just come down to the information desk under the question mark and we'll get you signed up for our summer reading club our grand prizes this year are a kindle fire uh, tablet and a kindle paperwhite e-reader so great prizes so, um, thank you, Brad, for coming all this way and coming to talk to us about birding. Happy to do so. Um, so I wanted to come and, and talk to you a little bit about birding, and, and I'm going to talk, the first part of my presentation will be about birding in general, uh, beginning birding, bird watching, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about backyard birding, uh, birding locally. Um, but. I am Brad Penley. I'm the wildlife biologist at Mingo. If you don't know where Mingo's at, uh, it's about 45 minutes south of here in Puxico, uh, the great metropolis of Puxico, Missouri. Uh, we, we, uh, we became a refuge in 1944. We're one of over 500 refuges uh, across the country. Uh, we were founded for uh, an area for migratory birds, mainly waterfowl, but, but all migratory birds uh, are included in that. And I invite you to come down and see us. We, we have a lot to offer. We have uh, two auto tours. We have a lot of bicycle riding, uh, an elevated boardwalk. And uh, most importantly, we just opened a brand new visitor center. And it's uh, really a spectacular building. So if you get a chance, come down and see us. We do offer birding uh, Saturday programs throughout the year. You can check our Facebook page or our web page uh, to see when those are if you're interested in coming for a guided tour. At Mingo, so we, it's one of your local spots that you can come and hit. And I'll talk about those a little bit later. But when I first started putting this together, I I didn't know what I wanted to cover, so I thought I'd I'd start with the basics. The basics of bird watching, what you need to get into the hobby, a little bit about bird watching in America. It's it's an eye opener. It was for me when I started to look at the numbers, how much money is spent. Uh, just on bird watching. This doesn't include how much money is spent on bird feed, feeders, that type. It's, it's in the billions. I have it on here. It's, it's worth it. Um, so I'll, I'll get started. Informal stop me ask questions. Um, if there's something pops in and you want clarification, don't hesitate to stop me right where I'm at. It's pretty, pretty free flowing here. So why bird watching? Why, why would people want to sit and watch birds? Well, it's pretty good outdoor recreation. Uh, we were having a conversation about how loud some of them are. Uh, they're, they're pretty interesting animals to watch and they do some really amazing things when you think about leaving the Arctic, flying all the way to South America twice a year and back each year. Uh, some bird species migrations alone uh, are incredible uh, how far a tiny little animal can go. Uh, and what that takes, and I, I won't get into that, but they are really interesting animals pretty much everywhere. Uh, we could walk right out here and probably pick up 10 or 12 species without leaving this grassy spot. Um, they're, they're all over the country, all over the world, and uh, pretty easy to watch. Uh, I like this one. They appeal to our sense of aesthetics. We, we like beautiful things, and birds being colorful for breeding. Um, Pretty hard not to be in awe of a uh, peacock, a uh, uh, cardinal, a uh, blue jay. Some of our more common birds, if you stop and think about how beautiful a, a cardinal or a blue jay is, it's as pretty as any bird you see in a pet store. And we have them everywhere. Uh, I mean, you can put up a feeder and, and have a pet store's worth of birds to look at. Uh, you can bird watch at any level. And, and we'll talk about this a little bit from uh, very casual as you see one sitting on a fence somewhere to traveling every free moment you have traveling the world to, to add to your life list and, and everywhere in between. Uh, so uh, there's, there's any level of birding that you want to do. Uh, you can do it alone or in a group. It can be appealing. It's something you don't need to be organized to do. 
it's a great excuse for being outside. If you like to be outside, it's, it's a good reason just to, to go. Uh, and you don't have to be rich to bird watch, and that's one of my favorite ones. Anybody can do it. Uh, anybody can, can bird watch. And you can cheat and be lazy by feeding them, and that's probably my favorite one. And this goes on in my house, and we cheat all the way around my house. We cheat their bird feeder stuff to uh, every door, window, outside on post, hanging in trees. I, I do spend a lot of money on sugar and sunflower seeds. So. And I have a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old, and they're, they're hooked. So I'm, I'm not going to get out of it anytime soon. Here's some of the facts I wanted to talk about there. 47 million people that identify themselves as bird watchers, birders in the U.S. I mean, you think about it, that's a pretty high percentage. Uh, the older you are, the more likely you are to bird, uh, but that's not, that, that's not a hard and fast thing, as I'll show you. As we talk about, income doesn't matter. You can do it at any level. There are more females than males. Well, I don't know if that's significant in any way, but I thought it was interesting. Um, spend lots of money as a group. You may not as an individual, but as a group you do. And I don't know if you guys can see that or not, but 47 million, 41 of them are around the home, and 18 million people travel to bird watch. Think about that. 18 million folks, and there are cities and towns, the, the lower Rio Grande Village, uh, the lower Rio Grande Valley in, in Texas that are set up just for bird watchers. I mean, they thrive on that business. People come from all over the world. You see the age breakdown, as I said, uh, it's a little bit skewed towards 55 plus, but you can see there's a representation uh, all the way through. And this is from the report that the Fish and Wildlife Service put out in, in 2011. Income. As I said, it's spread, and this, this one's pretty pretty level, so uh, it doesn't really matter where you're at uh, with your income or, or what you have because, again, it's free. It can be free. Uh, you don't need anything to bird watch, really. There's some things that make it more fun. But, uh, so trip expenditures. This is the one that I found really, this is just for bird-related trips. Um, 41 billion, with a B, uh, spent on trip-related expenditures, food, drink, lodging, public, private transportation, other trip-related costs related to bird watching. That's a staggering number. Uh, I had no idea when that, until I put this together that we would spend $41 billion. So, that's a little background about birding in the U.S. and. Um, what it means, and, and those, there are tax revenues associated with that that go back to, to, to help wildlife, to, to purchase uh, land, conservation areas, uh, provide facilities for wildlife in general, including birds. So it's, it's really an important part of the, the economy and the economics of, of managing uh, natural areas, managing refuges, state areas, things like that. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about how to become a better birder. How many of you folks in here would identify yourself as a birder, whether it be casual or, or what we call hardcore birders on the refuge? Pretty much everybody in here likes to, you know, to, to at some point stop and look at a birder. Um, we joke a little bit on the refuge. We, we can pick out a bird watcher, a hardcore birder in a hurry. They stick out. They, Herpers, people who like to look at snakes and reptiles and amphibians and birders. They're pretty easy to pick out, but they're not just a casual user of the refuge. There, there are some things to look at, and we'll look at some pictures. Um, it does take a little practice. With, like anything, the more you do it, the better you get at it. Uh, it's pretty easy to, uh, to identify our more common birds by sight when you see them on the feeder. But with practice, you, you get more exposure every time you see a new bird as a birder you most of them get very excited you add it to your life list we'll talk about life list a little bit later so some of the ways to become better you can learn from other birders that's a very common way to do so and, and birders tend to flock that's another <laughs> pun they have i guess birders flock they they like to exchange what they're seeing where 
field guide or go online. You don't necessarily have to buy it. We're sitting in a building that I'm sure has field guides, bird, bird field guides. Uh, so you don't have to spend money here. You can go to your local library and then a lot of things are online now. There are some wonderful bird guides online. Cornell has uh, University. Uh, Cornell has a fantastic birders resource. It's not just a guide, it's everything. Um, set of binoculars definitely helps, and we'll talk about binoculars um, specifically in a moment, but binoculars definitely help, especially if you're going to elevate past just, just looking at your feeder. But they can be handy at your feeder, too. Uh, keep notes and records. Again, this goes back a little bit to uh, to that life list and where you've seen different birds and where uh, birders in general like to keep up with, with their, their life list. It's, it's kind of the trophy. It's kind of the, the really passionate birders. That's, that's what they like to, and the really good ones we'll talk about it. You guys seen that movie that recently came out? Um, what was it called? I have a picture from it. The, the Good Year. Of, what was it? A Big Year. A Big Year, yeah. The life list. I really enjoy that. We actually show that one at the refuge every now and then, or we're going to now that we're open. That's, that's on our movie list. A backpack or a bag that you can grab. Um, if you have everything in one spot, I like to use this one. It's a little bigger than I need, but if you have all of your bird watching things in one spot, you can grab it and go when you get, get an opportunity, and that's pretty handy. And then uh, you can become better by using online resources, web pages, uh, rare bird reports. Missouri does have a rare bird, as do pretty much every other state uh, uh, in the country. Uh, so you can go on and, and keep up with rare birds. And then magazine subscriptions. I, I suspect that some of the local libraries also subscribe to, to Birders World, a few other backyard birds, things like that. There's some really good magazines out there, too. So binoculars, um, I brought two, an example of, of each type. Binoculars, uh, they come in all sizes and prices. You can spend anywhere from 10 or 20 bucks all the way up to, to two to 3,000, just depending on what you need, what level you're at, and um, what you want to spend. Um, it's important you get enough magnification. Uh, We'll talk about the numbers on binoculars in a minute, but uh, that's, that's something to keep in mind. Field of view is also important. So the magnification, if you're familiar at all, binoculars will have a number with an X and then another number. Uh, the first number is your magnification, uh, typically 8, 10, or 12 are the more common ones. Uh, and then the field of view is the number after the X, and that can be anywhere from, from 20 to, to 50 or even larger. And that's just how wide, how much light it can bring in and how wide the view is. Um, and those two numbers are important when you go to buy. Um, I recommend you shop around. If you are in the market for binoculars, shop around a little bit, borrow from others. If you get involved with the bird watching group locally, um, don't hesitate to stop and ask, hey, can I try your binoculars for a minute? Most birders will be happy to share their binoculars so you can get a feel for for what's out there and do a little research. You don't need gimmick spells and whistles, and we'll talk about this on the next slide, but just a pair of good sturdy binoculars. You, you don't need a lot of, of other things on your binoculars. Uh, it's a long-term investment in your hobby. Um, as I said, it can, can be multiple thousands of dollars if you want to go that far. Uh, you certainly don't have to, neither of those. I sell both of these from the intern's truck. That's when they're a little muddy. Uh, before I left, but um, you can look at those when we, we get finished. So those numbers we've talked about, that the 10 by 50, the 8 by 40, um, those are, are important to know, and that's why you should try out other ones. Uh, try out other folks. Go to a store. If you're ever in St. Louis and you're at Cabela's or Bass Pro Academy uh, locally, any place like that, look through a bunch of pairs. Uh, they'll have them out for you, uh, most of them. Look around in the store. It's, you'll learn a lot just from the size, feel, and shape, what you like and what you don't like. Um, buy a comfortable strap or harness. Uh, I went many years using the thin little strap that comes with most, and after you've had it around your neck for a while, you really get tired of that rubbing on the back. Uh, a nice, wide, uh, neoprene 
type strap or a harness is, is highly recommended. You can work that on this one. Um, it's just way easier if you're going to do it for a long time. Waterproof and ruggedness, uh, they will be beaten around. These two, like I said, came out of the intern truck. Um, I like the armor coated, the, the rubberized, uh, both for fill and for protection. Ease of focus is important. Uh, some folks like autofocus binoculars where you don't have a knob. I, I don't. Um, it's, that's a preferential thing. It's, it's on my list of bells and whistles, but that's when you can decide uh, as you're buying. Stabilization, some now are automatically stabilized, especially the big ones. You can buy binoculars that much like cell phones and cameras have a stabilization. Fixed focus, that's, that's really one that's a matter of preference. Zoom binoculars, I've never found much use for them. Some people really like them. Um, typically, I, I find that I don't use them. And whenever I do want to look at something and I throw them up to see a bird, it's either too, too close or too far. If it's a fixed one, I, I know what to expect when I let go. Two types, you have root prism, poro prism, and I won't get into this. Um, again, this is a preferential thing. Uh, you have some pluses and minuses, but generally uh, the root prisms are more in line, straight two tubes, and it's this shape, and it has a number of uh, advantages and disadvantages. And uh, then poro is offset, where you have different angled lenses that you can see the pattern of light uh, that goes through them. They work. It's, it's really a matter of preference. Um, Poros tend to be bulkier. I don't know if that's true anymore. Um, it's just really a matter of preference. That's why I highly recommend you go out and, and try a, a bunch of different ones. Um, I typically use the roof, the roof ones, but I've used both over my career and, and as a birder. You can't go too big, you know, just that. I've seen birders that you, they need a wheelbarrow. Uh, they just, you know, their binoculars are big and ringy. And, and if that's what you like, go for it. But uh, I thought that was appropriate. It, it, you, can, you can go overboard on how big uh, they are. Remember, you're, you want them to be portable, and you may have them around your neck for many hours if, if you really get into it. Um, so field guides. Switching gears from binoculars, a, a next, the next thing that you really need is a field guide. Um, again, you can go to the library, you can go online. I brought a few up here, but some of the things you, you need to do when you're first opening your field guide, you see a bird, um, you're going to want to try to get it into the general family. Are you looking at a waterfowl? Are you looking, uh, are you looking at waterfowl? Are you looking at a shorebird? Are you looking at an owl? Get it to a group because all of the field guides are grouped by family, by general groups. So you can flip through it. Um, how big is it? Pretty important. Uh, are we looking at a 12 inch long bird or a 4 inch long bird? Uh, outline and general shape can tell you a lot. I bet a lot of you, if you saw the silhouette of a cardinal, you'd identify that with, without any color, without any details. Just the same thing for a bald eagle. Outline and shape are very important. What's the bird doing? Um, that can sometimes help you out. Uh, some birds have uh, behaviors that are really easy uh, in helping identify them. A lot of the shore birds that are already tough to identify, I have a hard time with them still. Some of them will pump their tail, wag their tail. Some will squat and stand up rapidly. Uh, there are some telltale things that that can help you identify that bird. How does it fly? You guys ever stop to look at goldfinches when they fly? They swoop every wing beat. They're up and down. And you can see goldfinches all the way across the field and not be able to see their shape or color, but you can tell they're goldfinches by the way they fly. So that can be an important, an important uh, hint in identifying them. And then pick out identifying marks. This is probably the most important one when you come upon a bird that you really don't know what it is. Um, here are some things we'll talk about. Uh, go back. We'll look at uh, some identifying marks after this one. So what I've talked about so far is just visualizing, just what you see. Uh, 
but that's only half of birding. Uh, the other part is, uh, what do they sound like? Well, we were just discussing doves in, in New Mexico and how loud they, they were. Um, you can identify birds. I know two birders that are completely blind, and they do everything by, by sound, and they're incredible. I've learned so much from them on bird calls and little nuances of telling one from another. That's how they learn. Um, they, they both travel all over the country birding. Yeah. Their spouses love it, and they, they learn. So sound is, is, is important. Um, Sound will also tell you where the bird's at, often long before you see it, especially in the spring when they're calling. You can hear that bird. You know there's a bird, a warbler up in the top of a big oak tree or a bobolink in a thick prairie grass area. You're going to hear that often way before you see that bird, but it helps you hone in on where it's at. This is a biggie. Calls can help identify birds. Uh, a lot of folks some birds, especially spring tiny warblers, you may never see that bird. It may be on the top of a 120 foot pin oak, fluttering around catching bugs out of the blossoms, this warbler, and uh, you know, you can hear it, you know it's a magnolia warbler, but I'll be darned if you can find it. And it's, you're looking and looking and looking and then it flies off. Well, you still know you have a magnolia warbler. Um, Pick, pick your warbler. A lot of times you, you get them by sound only. Um, you can learn sounds. The, all the field guides have a, a written description of what their calls sound like and when they use them. Uh, the internet here is fantastic. The Cornell webpage has every, every bird on there. They have very clear, good recordings. Uh, you can buy CDs, uh, MP3s now, and download. Um, there are so many more resources. When I was in college, we had tapes. We had cassette tapes and then CDs. That was pretty fun when we moved to CDs. And so in ornithology, the actual class ornithology, uh, the entire semester we drove around all of our vehicles. We never listened to music. It was always learning bird calls because it was such a big part of our, our uh, class. And then the last one's practice, 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 just what I was talking about. The more you hear that call, uh, the more when you do hear it in the wild, it's going to pop into your head instantly. Oh, that's a whatever it is, and, and then you start looking for it. So it's the sound we've talked about. Where or when are you seeing the bird? That's important, and I'll show you why. So in being that we're in the center of the country, we get a lot of mig um, migratory birds moving through. And each bird will have a map associated with it that's color coded. And I'll just have a picture of it actually on here, but that tells you where that bird should be. Um, and birds don't read field guides, so <laughs> where they should be, not where they are, um, during a certain time of the year. And that's very important when you're trying to identify a bird. And when you go bird watching. It's important to know when you're going to have the most birds and if that bird's even going to be around if you're trying to target one or two species. So when are you seeing the bird? It's important to know where you're located. Uh, April in Missouri is way different than April in Canada. Um, so again, when and where go together. Uh, you need to, obviously, hopefully you know where you're at so you'll be able to go to the field guide and go, okay, it's reasonable that that bird would be here that time of year. Again, they don't read read the book. We have whistling ducks on the refuge. We have roseate spinbill show up on the refuge. They, you know, um, we have they fly. So sometimes they show up where they shouldn't be, where we say they shouldn't be. What habitat are you in? Um, you're not likely to see a prothonotary warbler in the desert. Uh, it's going to be over a swamp. Some birds, it, it doesn't matter. A morning dove, prime example, they could be anywhere from an urban park to uh, halfway up a mountain. Uh, yeah. But often, a bird will be tied to its, its favorable habitat, what it's looking for. So that's important, and that's in the field guide as well. So here's some of those markings I was talking about. And this is a little overwhelming. I don't want to go into it too much. But So you have a bird sitting here that you don't recognize. 
you'll learn as you become uh, more and more accomplished birder what to look for. There are some things, tail shape, wings and wing bars, eye rings, the shape of the beak. Again, we talked about the size and coloration. Those things are obvious, but after that first initial viewing, you, you really start to pick out small parts of that bird to help you identify it when you don't know what it is. Uh, on the head alone, uh, and often on the head will tell you a lot. This eye ring right here will tell two birds that otherwise are very similar looking. One has a white eye ring, one doesn't. And I don't know why we do this. We, we separate birds, we being biological community. It's not just birds, plants, all animals. For some reason, we like to split them. Um, but little minor things, stripes on the head, um, throat patches, very common, shape of the bill, as I said. So that eye ring is often one that, that really is uh, telling. On the wing, you're, you're going to want to look for wing patches, different colorations, uh, wing bars. Give you an example, waterfowl. Each year we have hunters give us wings from all over the flyway, from Canada to Louisiana. And we go through, we meet over at SIU in Carbondale and go through. And that way we can have a representation of what birds have been shot, uh, what the harvest is related to what we went into the season with. Uh, and we only use wings. And you can tell all the waterfowl apart just by that wing. Uh, both age, sex, and then by species. Age is a little tougher, but definitely by sex and, and what species. So, wings are important. Hard bound uh, copies, uh, non digital, well, digital too for that matter. Uh, field guides really come in two separate types, two types uh, the drawing format, and more recently, the, the actual photos have become more and more popular. Um, some really good photographs in here. This is just like binoculars, it's your preference. Most birders have both. Um, you can see that's, that's not nearly all of my bird guides. Um, it's just a, a selection. So it's really your choice. And again, go to the library, go to the bookstore, uh, flip them open, and see which one you like more. They all have basically the same information inside. It's just what format do you like the most. Uh, things to remember when you do go to purchase your field guide, um, make sure it covers where you will be at. I have two up here. Peterson's. Um, not all bird guides are nationwide. This is eastern, this is western. The line goes right through the prairies. If you're only going to buy one, you buy a bigger one that covers the entire, well basically North America, but the, all the U.S. for sure. But what do you notice about the difference here? if you're lighting these around all day. So there are trade-offs. Uh, there are trade-offs when you're, when you're buying uh, your field guides. Uh, make sure it's at the correct level. And they come everywhere from a 20 or 30 page basic birding, backyard birding guides to some of these. Uh, there are some that cover continent. There's one for Australia that's, you know, gay thick and it's, it's huge. You'll, you'll get that feel pretty quickly as to what level of a field guide you need. Most fall into this type category, though, and they're, they're complete. They're, that's all you need. But it, it depends on what you're looking for and what you want to spend. More than one doesn't hurt. Um, I've already covered that. Um, they have a built-in life list, back of that life list. It can be uh, a good thing. This one doesn't. I think I brought Stokes and a few others. Yeah, this one does, Kaufman's. Um, that's purely up to you if you want that or not. Um, I want to cover one more thing. Uh, there are specialty bird books, uh, field guides. Um, each of these publishers, uh, authors like to uh, come out with more because they can sell more. This one's shorebirds, and it's just shorebirds. There's one for hawks. There's one, believe it or not, for South and Central America just for uh, hummingbirds. Uh, raptors, uh, warblers, that's a really popular one. The warblers only field guide. Uh, so 
as you move on, make sure you buy the one that, that you need. So a general one would be your first one as you, if you get into the hobby more and more, you may want to buy uh, something more like this. If you really get, say you're going to Pennsylvania or going to Hawk Mountain where you're specifically going to be looking for raptors flying over, a lot of folks would buy the Hawk specific. That's just more detailed. So birdie, where can you go? Uh, this one's a, a really good one because we can do it right now. If we wanted to, we could turn and look out and probably see birds in, in the bushes right outside. Oh, there's some strange birds out there. Now. Yeah, yeah. They, <laughs> so you're gonna have to pick out what you want to use to identify. <laughs> right, Wiggly stars. Um, so state conservation areas. <laughs> you're surrounded by them. Uh, you have. I put the ones further south, but there are state, Missouri Department of Conservation, uh, conservation areas all over the place. There are plenty all the way around us. You have a great one right here at the Nature Center. Uh, they have a lot of birding resources there. They offer a lot of, of birding classes, uh, hikes. The Cape Nature Center is a resource that you guys, if you've not been there or, and you're not using it, you really should, especially as a birder. They have bird feeders with water features right outside huge plate glass windows and in the spring especially you can really pick up some neat birds sitting at the Cape Nature Center. Um, wildlife refuges, we, we have uh, quite a few in Missouri and there are quite a few across the line in Illinois, one in Kentucky. Again, Mingo's uh, your closest one, Cypress Creek's over in southern Illinois is not far away either. Um, we offer a lot of of birding opportunities, be it on your own or, or if you come as a, a group or as a class. Uh, state parks, this is a little different than the, uh, the parentheses. Uh, um, Sam A. Baker, Wapapello, Trail of Tears here can be really good one here in Cape, especially in the spring that they have a lot of birds going through. In your local parks, uh, we're within a couple miles of some really good birding parks can be really good this spring. And then my favorite, your backyard. In town, along the road, uh, in a vacant lot, on a lake, it, it doesn't matter, birds are everywhere. So, when should you go? Before I go through any of this, you should go when you have an opportunity. If you enjoy doing it, go. There are always birds around. There, there are always birds to look at, no matter what time of year, what the weather go when you can, but year-round, there are some seasons that are better, quote-unquote better, but it really depends on the bird you're looking for. Um, so spring and fall, you have all the warblers and all the migratory birds coming back through. Spring, they're in their breeding plumage, they're much easier to identify in the spring than the fall for the warblers. Uh, they talk a lot more in the spring because they're, they're pair bonding all the way up, so you can identify them by call which with warblers, it's very helpful. Uh, winter for waterfowl here. Uh, we were talking before we started the Mingo. If you want to come to look at waterfowl, we'll have uh, up to maybe a quarter million waterfowl the first weekend in December if the weather's normal. And uh, you can see pretty much every species of duck that, that occurs in Missouri on the refuge. Lots of eagles. If you want to see bald eagles, we have over 100. And the state areas along the river here, there are plenty of places, but winter time's a better time to see eagles unless you're, you're looking at nest. Um, so some seasons are better than others, but it's important to know um, if the bird you're looking for is going to be here uh, during that season. Early morning, especially in the hotter parts of the year, the birds seem to be more active and get less active um, as the day goes on, especially when it's hot like this, and then they'll pick up again in the evening. Um, it depends on what you want to see. I covered that a little bit. Uh, don't forget night birding, uh, especially in urban areas. You can pick up some neat birds right here in town. Night hawks fly over all the time. We call them bull bats. It's another name for them. They have this weird bark. They have a high pink, pink, pink as they're flying. You've probably seen them around buildings in town. I know they're all over Cape. Over by Sam's Club. Uh, and then they bark. They have this weird, I don't even know how to describe it, but this weird uh, call that they do. Uh, and it's as they're catching bugs. Uh, 
pretty neat. Owls, obviously, if you want owls, they're going to be out more at night, uh, and that's birding here again. So there are a lot of birds, uh, Chuckwell's widow, uh, whippoorwills, things like that, that you're going to get at night. Uh, whenever you have the time to itch, that's really the best time to get. I always cover this a little bit. Um, remember I talked about the lower Rio Grande Valley, um, and this is where I was first exposed to it first big birding trip I ever went on. There are literally hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of birders at these different parks, uh, pull-offs. They're all well documented what birds are where. And these days you can get texts instantly whenever a bird pops up and you're within X number of miles. Uh, it's, it's really amazing what you can be led on to. But anyway, birding ethics are important, especially if you're in a very hot spot at a birding destination. You don't want it to uh, impact other birders, you want to be careful not to ruin others' experiences. So try not to disturb birds or their habitat. That's, that's a given, legally and ethically. Uh, stay on established pathways, roads, uh, when you're in the vehicle, off-roading is frowned upon for, by birders, uh, by anybody, uh, in certain places. Uh, and it happens more than you think. Birders are, can be zealots, they uh, sign doesn't apply to them often. So, and uh, you really have to, to pay attention. Don't disturb the birds when they're nesting. That's important. Uh, view them, but, but try not to flush them off of their nest. Um, don't overuse playback tapes, and we haven't covered this, but if you're ever in a really birding hot spot, people have tapes of various birds that they'll use to get the birds they're looking for to call at or to come and investigate. Screech Owl is a popular one, but you know, they'll actually play a tape or mimic that sound with, with their mouth and small passerine birds will come and perch to look for this predator. Uh, so they use it and that can actually be overused. Don't trespass. Uh, don't go in a herd. That one's a little sketchy. You just have to use your judgment there. But some of these places can really get crowded. Uh, you may have a rare bird that has three or four hundred people literally trying to see it. It's not, to me, it's not enjoyable, but some people checking that bird off the list is more important than anything else. So uh, be cognizant of, of the disturbance factor if you're, you're with a lot of folks. My favorite, birding in your backyard. Um, you can cheat. We've talked about this, and I love to cheat. Uh, feeders. Feeders allow you to attract birds right to your, your kitchen window. We have a bump out where our kitchen table is uh, with, with five big windows and we have feeders right there. And we can't make it through supper without a delay to go look at whatever bird's out there. Um, rural, urban, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can attract birds no matter where you live. Um, You'll often get to see other species. I had two bulls out yesterday evening eating sunflower seeds under mine. Uh, chipmunks are common. Uh, we've talked about squirrels. Often you have species you may not want to show up. Um, you also get some interaction. If you have a lot of birds, you often get a predatory raptors, shark chin, cooper hawk, cooper's hawks. They'll actually learn that they can feed at your feeders. So they get a meal as well. So, Often you'll just see a puff of feathers. All the birds will scatter and poof, and then they'll look up in the tree and, and he's having one of the birds have been feeding for the last six months. Uh, and you can do it without going outside. That's, that's kind of the fun one. You can do it from inside when it's 100 degrees outside. If your feeders, if you have water and it's in a shady place, you'll often have birds to look at uh, without ever going outside. So you really can't cheat with feeders. What I like, I, it's tongue in cheek a little bit cheating, but uh, it, it, it really adds a new dimension when you start to feed them. So when to feed. Uh, for seed-eating birds, you, you feed pretty much year-round. It's up to you. Um, you're going to get more common feeder uh, birds to show up. And I brought some literature for you guys and bird lists, but NBC just put this one out, Feeding Backyard Birds. I highly recommend you grab one. Um, Winter can be the most productive time simply because there's less food out there for the birds to eat and if you're providing a reliable seed source, often they'll be, become habituated and, and come more often. Uh, 
spring and summer, a lot of folks don't think about it, and a lot of folks stop feeding seeds after winter, after fall and winter, but spring and early summer can be important, especially if they're nesting, uh, and those birds have become uh, relying on your feeder. Uh, I have a lot of chickadees and a lot of tip mice that feed, uh, feed their young. The cardinals, too, that come to the feeder kind of make them lazy, but you get to see them. Uh, so. Um, it is, it can be important, there's some debate about this, but if you do have a large number of birds, especially in the winter when it's harsh, uh, there's some real debate about what happens if you let your feeder run out. And I don't really want to get into that, I, I think it's still out there, but uh, you know, if the birds are habituated to coming and you've art artificially attracted more than what would be there normally, wife and I have this debate whether or not so it almost becomes they're dependent on you. Uh, and I don't like to think about it that way, but um, some folks do. So you can make that decision on your own. Uh, you can use all types of feed feeders uh, depending on what you want to see and where you live. And then I put these up here and they can be anything. I mean, do you see this? This is a bottle with wooden spoons shoved through it and little holes knocked in it. Perfectly functioning. Bird feeder. And that's, you know, you're out a buck or two there plus a seed and a yard sale less than that for the spoons. You can also use twigs. I know many folks who will take this feeder and just shove a branch through it and fill it. So it's kind of like anything else with birding. You can go all out and go crazy and make a um, Taj Mahal type deal for your birds or you can have a two liter bottle with sticks shoved in it. Um, platform feeders. Different birds like different types of feeders, and you'll see this. Uh, you have platform feeders like this um, that will attract certain types of birds. Soot feeders, uh, this is uh, some type of base, whether it be dough or tallow or, or some type of fat with seeds mixed into it. Uh, woodpeckers, things like that really are attractive, but everything uses them, and year-round it's a very high energy source. My girls love these. They have feeders stuck to their bedroom windows. They have no chance not to just be burners, so they can raise it. So they have feeders stuck to their windows, and that's a, a big deal for them when, when a chickadee flops in. They're this far away. I mean, they're sitting staring, and chickadees are so used to them, they don't even care anymore. So, um, and then you can you know, be pretty whimsical or really decorative. Uh, specialty feeders, I put this one up here, bluebirds. People are feed, they, they go to the pet store or buy in bulk. You can buy volleyball sized bulk bags of freeze dried uh, mealworms and waxworms and things now. And they put up feeders for bluebirds, for worm eating birds. Uh, peanuts are popular for jays, uh, woodpeckers, they like to eat peanuts. Um, where do you want to put them? Uh, you want to have a place for them to perch, whether it be on the feeder or adjacent to. Um, where you can easily reach them. You don't want them so high that it's an effort to fill them up, to get them down and fill them up. And if they are, you're less likely to fill them up and keep them full. Uh, they'll just go find they're hanging there empty. Um, you want to pay attention to putting them too close to a window, especially if it's a window that they can see through to another window. They don't realize there's glass there, and they'll fly in and hit them. If you do have this situation, I highly recommend you put up silhouettes of, of hawks or, or something, streamers, something, so that they can see that there's a window there so they don't crash into them. Away from predators such as, uh, such as cats, and I put cats up here because it's one that humans bring in. Uh, cats kill over a billion with a bee, birds per year, so keep that in mind. If you have a lot of feral cats, you want to think about whether or not you want to concentrate birds for them. Um, and where you have a clear view. I mean, the whole point of having it up there is for your enjoyment, not only to feed the birds, but for your enjoyment. So you want to have a clear view of your feeders. What to feed. Well, this list is grows every year. People come up with something new that birds like. Um, I'll say this about food. Um, some of the mixed foods, the seed mixes, have a lot of millet, and cracked corn, they're the cheapest. Um, 
it's fine. A lot of our birds like that, but you're also going to get a lot of birds that you may not want, like house sparrows and starlings that will take over your feeder. Also, uh, squirrels like sunflowers, but they really like corn. So if you have a squirrel this year, you may want to get away from corn if you can. Um, thistle, uh, for things like uh, goldfinches, all your finches like thistle. Uh, if you're buying thistle, look on the bag, make sure it's irradiated or somehow made sterile. Uh, otherwise, you could be spreading the base of plant, uh, bull thistle, musk thistle, whatever the thistle seed. Most of what you buy now is nitro thistle. But just be cognizant you could spread some thistle. You want to make sure that, that it's, the, it's been treated so that it's not viable seed, if you can. Uh, peanut butter, uh, some of the most simple feeders are a pine cone rolled in peanut butter with seed on them. I mean, every kid at camp makes those, and they're good feeders. So we talked about people now buy, I was at a, there are stores are strictly for burgers <coughs> in a lot of bigger cities, but they sell bulk bags of uh, dehydrated cranberries and blueberries and raisins and they're for feeding birds, not people. <laughs> it's just, I mean, they're expensive. They're really expensive. Um, this can be where a lot of your cost is in buying seed, and you may be tempted to buy the cheapest mix you can find. Just be aware that a lot of those cheaper mixes will be thrown out onto the ground because the birds will sift through to get what they like. Uh, all I feed at my house, that right there, and, so, and peanuts on occasion. Uh, everything like sunflowers. My girls have thistle feeder, a uh, hanging sack. You can use pantyhose if you don't want to buy a thistle feeder. Piece of pantyhose filled with with this, we'll see how by wind that works pretty well. Um, nectar feeders, uh, not just for hummingbirds, but Orioles also like them. We had quite a few Orioles hit our house. Again, you can have, you can go anywhere from uh, a cup with a hole drilled in it that they can, can dip into to very elaborate, beautiful glass ones uh, to one stuck to the window. It's really whatever you want to spend and buy. You can really make a statement with your hummingbird feeders. Um, one thing you notice, and we'll cover this in a minute, look at all the fluid in all of these feeders other than that one is tinted. Um, I'll let that one slip by. So, a quarter cup of sugar for one cup of water um, is a typical hummingbird ratio. No food color. You do not need to add food color. It actually causes tumors on the bills of hummingbirds. Uh, it's not needed. They're not honing in on, as long as your feeder is red, you don't need it. Uh, and your feeder doesn't actually have to be red either. It's just their favorite. Uh, food coloring actually is harmful. You're, you're hurting the hummingbirds if you have food coloring in there. The orange for Orioles has never really been shown, and Orioles do key in on orange. You may, uh, but they don't need it either. The Oriole feeders are orange and they'll hit those anyway. But no food coloring, I can't stress that enough. Believe it or not, some folks put artificial sweeteners instead of sugar. Um, the hummingbirds don't really know and they're not getting energy. So you're hurting them. Uh, they spend, they're spending their time. It's not very common, but I just I put it up there to think about. Don't use artificial sweeteners. You need to keep them clean. They don't have to be sterilized spotless, but when you start to see mold in and around it during the hotter part of the year, just take them in, scrub them off with hot soapy water as you're filling them, uh, keep them somewhat clean. Another big debate about hummingbirds, do you put them in, out and take them up before the, you know, when's the right time to do it? Well, I found, and most people agree now, I think that you put them up when you see the first hummingbird and take them down when they stop eating them and they've left for the fall. The birds will tell you, you're not artificially going to hold birds in your area too long. And that was always the debate, are you keeping hummingbirds in your area too long? But leave them up until they stop eating the, when you stop seeing them and after four or five days. Keeping in mind that there are wave upon wave of hummingbirds coming from the northern tier states, southern Canada, through our area. So during the late fall, you'll have burst of 
you'll have uh, on a rainy day you may have 20 or 30 hummingbirds one evening and then the next day not have any during the fall uh, but they'll tell you when you'll know you don't have to boil the water especially if you have hummingbirds like in my house uh, I have four feeders and they go through one full one all four of them they drink them down in one day so I don't boil. The only reason you boil uh, the water, the mindset was to uh, purify it, to, to sterilize it. Well, that sugar you're dumping in and that feeder that you're putting it in are not sterilized, so it's really a wasted step. And a quarter cup of sugar will dissolve in hot tap water uh, without boiling. So that's a step you don't have to do. In fact, I keep a gallon milk jug with it mixed up every evening. I just mix up a gallon because that's what they drink. I go through a gallon of gallon a day. Um, my wife hits sands for those big bags. Yes, ma'am. We um, moved over the past year and uh, we had hummingbirds at our old house. And so we wanted to establish hummingbirds at our new house. Mm -hmm. And I waited until I saw one, which was not that long ago. Um, I guess about three weeks ago mm -hmm. or so. And it had flown in over a bush that had some red leaves popping up at the top. And it flew around, saw they were just leaves, and then flew off. And I thought, oh, there's a hummingbird. So I got the feeder ready, and I hung it coming out over top of that bush. Yeah. I haven't seen a hummingbird since. It takes a while, and you've missed the main migration. Yeah. So they become habituated. I haven't banded any at my house, but they know, and they come back. And the ones that hatch in my trees around my house come back, uh, we think. Next spring, put them out early. You'll get birds flying through. When you put them out in March, when they first show up, they're gonna stay, as long as you keep them full. And then you'll, over time, we have more hummingbirds each year at my house. The first year, same thing. We didn't have as many. Now on a rainy night, when it's about to storm right at dark, I can count 80 to 100 hummingbirds. Uh, it's really, and my kids will actually land on their fingers now. The kids will stand in a chair and hold when it's like that, when they're mass feeding really hectically, and they'll land on them. It's fun. They have to spring. Uh, next spring, have them out early. You'll keep them there, and they'll be attracted to it, and then over the years, you'll get them. So I won't get any in the fall? No, you, you certainly will, uh, but you won't have ones that have been habituated to those features, so I'd leave it up. Uh, well, I read that um, they were, where they're born, they come back to and lay their eggs. They do. So year after year, you're going to have and it just takes time. But the critical, have it up in the fall because they'll hit it. All those birds are migrating back through our area and they'll learn that that's a feed station. And somehow those tiny little pea brains, literally pea brains, can remember that. Um, and they'll, they'll, even ones that don't breed in your, in your yard or immediate vicinity will remember it. And their migration path is usually more. in generation after generation, they learn that. So just put them up and leave them up. And They'll be there. Uh, I mean, hummingbirds are it's a species that have benefited so much for human activity uh, with the feeding we do. Uh, another thing you can do, and this is the last thing I'm covering, is landscape. Um, most people think about feeding only, but you can actually plant. Even the smallest garden can have hummingbird-friendly plants in it or, or wild bird-friendly uh, plants. You know, they like. Uh, you can plant nectar producing plants, you can have bird baths. Uh, and again, a bird bath. The thing about bird bath, to keep in mind, you can use anything, just make sure they can get out of it. So a bucket, a five gallon bucket, can actually be a trap for some species. So um, you'll want to, to keep it shallow, that's why they're all shaped like a bowl, uh, so they can get in and out. Uh, natural water, if you have it, you can plant along stream, streams, creeks, ponds to enhance. Uh, use native plants where you can. NBC has a nursery. Uh, Missouri Department of Conservation has a nursery where you can get trees, native plants that are wildlife friendly. Uh, so you can actually attract more birds. Uh, evergreens are important for nesting birds and for cover. So you may want to have some pines or some spruce uh, around. Crazy birders, I throw this one up. I've seen this many times, I've seen this many times. It, it, it's an addiction, people come from all over the world and people, some people love this. Me personally, I like the smaller groups are by myself, but 
you know, you can get a lot of information and a lot of good contacts just by hanging out with birders. And if you like to do that, and you both like to do that, you already have something in common. You can meet a lot of really neat, interesting folks birding. And this is from the movie. Uh, they were really popular with the birding magazines for a while. Uh, I put Don't Take It to the Extreme, it's crazy bird lady. You can always pick out a birder on the, on the refuge. And, you know, birders standing on top of vehicles on the side of a road or uh, with a covered mohawk. This is at Hawk Mountain uh, with a crazy bird crest. You know, kind of fun. So that's it. You guys have questions? Are there less purple martins this season than normal? Or purple martins are one of those species that fluctuate year in, year out. They're cyclic species, so very well could be. I haven't noticed them. I live in the woods, so I don't have boxes up. My dad has boxes, and he asked the same question. He's, he has fewer than he did like the last couple of years. So it's, it's probably just a signal thing. Um, we have a bad breeding season where they lose a lot of chicks. You'll have fewer the next year, but they make up for it. Uh, but no, I haven't noticed. Uh, I, my dad over in Kentucky is the only one that's mentioned it to me, but uh, yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. It's, it's not uncommon. Any other ones? Thank you guys for having me. Again, there's some literature. I brought a Mingo bird checklist, which will serve you well for anywhere in southeast Missouri, not just Mingo. Uh, a couple of NBC publications and one of our pamphlets, and then I have uh, five field guides and some binoculars if you want to stop and have a look at them. And I'll hang around if you guys have any questions you want to ask me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.